All it takes is one night. Alice Ozma has been described as an impressive reader and writer, and her book, The Reading Promise, has been called remarkable and imaginative. But more importantly for me, however, it, it's a rallying cry, advocating the importance of books and of reading every day. And like Alice, a promise to read every day is something that we at the School of Library and Information Science believe in. The Reading Promise is about Alice and her relationships with her friends, her family members, especially her dad, and with books. When Alice was nine, she and her father made a promise to read aloud together for 100 consecutive nights. This is when the streak begins. They continue reading together for 1,000 nights, then 1,500, then 2,000, and finally until day 3,218, the day Alice starts college. The Reading Promise is about the books they shared, but it's about so much more. But I'll let Alice tell you about that. A graduate of Rowan University and currently the National Manager of Reading Programs and Events for Scholastic Book Fairs, Alice is passionate about literature, education, and gluten-free pizza. <laughs> Please help me welcome Alice Ozma. be a tough act to follow. Oh my goodness, there was so much emotion in this room. This was like beautiful. It was so much fun to watch everybody receiving their awards and um, you guys clearly have such a great program here. I'm just um, really honored to be a part of it, uh, to be able to spend this time with you. I want to begin by saying how impressed I am with your commitment to reading at this school. I am just blown out of the water by the, first of all, just the sheer amount of books. Can we touch on that? You guys have books everywhere. Every building is a library. I passed like 12 libraries. <laughs> I mean, that's so cool. This is a really, this is a great school. You have so many programs. You have so much commitment. And people are rabid about it. People are truly rabid about reading. I mean, I love that. This is, you are, you are my kind of people. Um, if, if I can bring you all to Philly, I would love that. Um, and I have to talk a little bit about this Copies Reading Express program. Um, wow. I mean, it's, 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 it's a one word description. Wow. This is so incredible to me. Um, the way that you're leveraging all of these resources, that, that it's storytelling, that the kids get a book, that they get to interact with this mascot. And I have to tell you, um, so this is no insult to your school. I didn't know anything about your mascot. I like. My friends play a game where they try to get me to name three people in the NFL. So um, I have no idea. I don't know touchdown, sport pass, whatever. Um, but I know you guys have a football team. And the cocky may be involved in some way. Um, <laughs> so I had no idea you know, what a celebrity he was. And um, Kim pulls me aside and says, Let, let's watch a video of, of cocky walking into a room and, and talking to kids about books. It was like. Santa slash Jesus. <laughs> I mean, it was insane. Those children were like, my favorite is the kids were turning to each other and going like, oh. <laughs> they can't believe what's going on. They're losing their minds. That's so wonderful because then you take that energy and you turn that into reading energy and you make them want to become readers. You, you use that wonderful mystique of cocky. Um, <laughs> to, to make people read, and I'm just so impressed, and I have to tell you how sincere this is, because I travel the country and I talk about reading everywhere, really, I've been everywhere, and um, I can't think of a place I've seen with a stronger commitment to reading, and I mean that from the bottom of Just um, truly beautiful to me. So. Um, weird author thing when I do my author thing, which is that I don't talk a lot about my book um, because it's not very good. So uh, I'll touch on it, but I'm, I'm going to talk about my experiences too. Um, I also don't read from my book because I think you all know how to read. So um, <laughs> you can just do that on your spare time. Um, so we were talking a little bit before I got started and I said, what kind of, what kind of people usually come here? And Kim was saying, well, it's a little bit more academic. And I thought, well, this is, I'm, I might not be a great fit. That's not really what I talk about. But um, I, before I do begin, I am going to say I have a ton of books that I love that, you know, if you want to come up I, after, you, you know them too, I'm sure we can talk about those books. I love The Reading Zone by Nancy Atwell, The Book Whisperer, 
Igniting a Passion for Reading by Stephen Lane. I love all of these. We can talk about those. Mine's way more personal. So just look to them. They have cooler stuff to say than I do. Um, but my book is my book is very personal because my stories are personal. And for that reason today, my presentation is going to be personal. And for this, I would like to ask you all to put on a different kind of hat than I think you typically wear. Um, it's not your researcher hat or your educator hat, but I want you to put on the father hat, the mother hat, the sister, brother, whoever you are, friend, guardian, put that on, that hat on. Because I'm gonna to talk to you about what I got out of our reading promise, my father and I, and I'm gonna to try to convince you to do the same with someone, just anyone in your life. I'm gonna, I'm gonna to try to convince you to do that. So I want you to think about what you can personally do, not just, you know, what can you do as an academic? I mean, that's great. And clearly you guys have, I can't talk to you about that. You're way better. I, I have a BA. I mean, I'm 25, so I'm not going to do that. That's not what this presentation is about. This is about what I think you can personally do um, in your relationships. And I hope that at least one person will develop a love of reading because of you, because of this experience. So before we begin, I would like to ask you to try to take a moment and visualize someone in your life, whoever that may be. Maybe it's a child, an elderly neighbor, someone you mentor, just someone who you could spend more time reading with, reading to, even just discussing books with. So I'm going to give you a minute to think of that person. OK, it was a quick minute. It was a 10 second minute. Um, but I hope that you've all thought of somebody, because I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how, how I think you should go about this. Um, but I'm not going to do this exactly directly. I'm going to tell you what I think I got out of having a reading promise. And I'm hoping that in doing that, you'll say, Alice got so much out of having a reading promise. Um, I should do this with someone in my life. And I really believe it can be anyone. So I have to start with the, the obvious question, which is, what is a reading promise? And we kind of touched on what I did. But um, to recap, when I was in fourth grade, my dad, my dad had been reading to me aloud a lot. He was a um, elementary school librarian. So both of my parents were librarians. You are my people. Um, <laughs> and now I work for Scholastic Book Fairs, which is like, I'm, you know, the drug dealer to librarians. <laughs> they love us. <laughs> um, so, both of my parents were librarians, and my dad read to me every night, and we had a great reading relationship. But when my sister was in fourth grade, and if you heard my dad tell this story, it's, it's so vivid. These memories are like seared into his brain. Um, he was reading her Dear Mr. Henshaw, mm -hmm. and she, she said, Dad, OK, I'm in fourth grade. Cool it. They were like halfway through the book. She said, like, cool it. I'm done. I can read on my own. And she asked him to stop reading to her. Now, the funny thing is, before I go on, I told that story like national television, NPR, and my sister called me and said, that's not what happened. I asked if I could read to him, and he said, no, he's a better reader. So <laughs> take it with a grain of salt. Somebody's probably telling the truth here. Um, but so he had these clear memories of my sister halfway through the book, fourth grade, saying, I don't want to read with you anymore. My sister and I are eight years apart. So he had a lot of thinking time with me before I reached fourth grade. And um, when I got to fourth grade, he said, Lovey, he calls me Lovey. Lovey, I have an idea. By the way, his voice is higher pitched than mine, so this is, this is not accurate. When people heard the audiobook, it was a shock to them. They were like, who's that nice woman reading the introduction? <laughs> <laughs> um, he said, Lovey, I have an idea. Let's try to read for 100 nights in a row without missing a night. I'll read to you for 100 nights in a row. And this is a pretty big challenge. I mean, it, even just that, that was like, oh my god, 100 nights in a row? How are we going to do this? There's so much stuff that comes up. Somebody could get sick. I mean, there's, OK. So we tried it. Um, and we did it. And it was so exciting. I mean, this was a really big deal. So we went out for pancakes. And um, this was before I knew I had celiac, so uh, they weren't gluten free. Um, we went out for pancakes, and while we were out for pancakes, we were discussing, what do we do now? And I said, Dad, we have to go for a 1,000 nights. And when he does this, sometimes he travels with me, and he's not very good at it, so don't worry. You're not, you're not missing anything. Uh, <laughs> when he travels with me, he says, when I said 1,000 nights, he was like really uncomfortable, but he didn't want to tell me, you know, I'm this, this fourth grader with big hopes. And he was like, I didn't want to 
crush your dreams and tell you that nobody can do anything for a thousand nights in a row. And he was like, you were not very bright then. So I just, you know, I let it go. <laughs> um, so he, he convinced me. He was like, yeah, whatever. We'll try for a hundred nights. And in his mind, no possibility. Maybe even like we wouldn't even get to 150. I mean, a hundred was really hard. So we were for a thousand nights. And by that time I was, you know, middle school, junior high. And, um, we, that was a strange moment because a thousand nights was this huge, unimaginable goal. We couldn't wrap our brains around a thousand nights and then you get there. It's like, well, what do we do from here? So we just kind of said, let's just keep going until something happens. Um, and nothing ever did. <laughs> it was a bizarre, it was a bizarre situation. Nothing ever stopped us from being able to read together. So we ended up reading um, 3,218 nights, which was until my first day of college. It's a really long time. And um, our final night of reading together, this is the, we were interviewed for CBS Evening News for this. And anytime, they'd say, tell us about the final night. And we just go, I can't do this. <laughs> it, was, <laughs> it was super emotional. But um, he had read to me you know, for, for such a long time, since fourth grade, and we knew that on this 3,218th night, it's my first day of college. I mean, there's no way, there's no conceivable way. I had just gotten my first cell phone. You know, this wasn't going to work. Um, and we knew that. And so we said, we, got, we have to end it here. We got to end it on top. So um, we went down into the stairwell of my college, and, and he read to me in the stairwell. You know, my roommates are upstairs, like, probably trying to sneak beer into our mini fridge. And I'm like, I'm just going to be in the basement reading with my dad, <laughs> crying hysterically. It's no big deal. Um, so that is, that is the story of our 3,218 nights. And I refer to it, you might hear me refer to it as the streak or the reading promise. We called it the reading streak because my dad's a baseball guy, so, you know, like hitting streak. But um, that was the title I proposed to the publisher, and she said it sounded like the reading through town naked. So <laughs> <laughs> we are not the reading streakers, we're the reading promisers now. Um, but, you know, for those of you who are, I am, I'm a big Malcolm Gladwell fan, and at this point that's like saying you breathe air, like everybody's a big Malcolm Gladwell fan. Um, when you talk about those hours of practice, the hours and hours and hours of practice, Boy, did I get those hours of practice. Oh my goodness. I heard everything from, you know, when I was in fourth grade, we were still reading Judy Bloom, And then in high school, I, we were reading Shakespeare. And my dad would do all the voices and not see which voice he was. Very confusing. But, um, <laughs> but we got there. And I felt like I got a ton out of this. Um, you know, obviously, there's the, the super superficial stuff. Um, Academically, well, not that that's superficial, but my grades were better, and um, I edited two magazines in college, and I was an English major, and all that good stuff. And I did theater, and I think that um, that all those words helped. But one of the things I always like to point out that I don't think people think of: this really taught me consistency, and I think that's a skill that people don't learn anymore. And I'm not just, I'm, you know, as a young person, I'm able to say that. It's not even me being mean to the generation; it's my generation. We're not consistent people. You know, if we make plans with you, it's like 50-50, we're actually going to do this. Um, we're, we're, like, we're the generation of flakes. Um, and so I am maybe one, in, one of the 50 people my age that if you make plans with me, like, we're good. Those plans are solid. Because my dad taught me through this process of reading together every night that nothing came up that we could not get through. Whatever it was, I was expected to be home by midnight to get read to. And, you know, there were, there were some moments when that was difficult, especially in high school. Um, <laughs> that, was, that was rough. But I learned that, that it was something that I could always do, that, that it was this attainable thing. So now, anytime something sounds like, oh, I can't do that, that takes a big commitment. Please, I made, the, I made a huge commitment. I got through this, I'm fine. Um, so consistency was a big part of it. Also, usually when I'm talking to kids, I play this game with them where like I try to get in on them. I said, did I get anything else out of this reading experience? And then finally, some, some little kid will go, you got to write a book. <laughs> so that's a big one too. I mean, that was kind of cool. Um, people like to ask me, so you know, I'm hoping at this point you're picturing doing this with somebody who's got your, your visual in your mind of who you're going to be consistent with. People like to ask me, how did we get, keep this going? How is this even fathomable to keep this going? 
And um, I have a couple thoughts on that. First of all, we made this, this reading experience and each other our top priority. And I think whatever your top priority is for the day, you are able to do that thing. You just have to put it near the top of your list. And um, since, since there's some younger college students, this is the example I always use with college students when I speak to them. How much time, people my age, how much time, legitimately, do you spend going on Facebook and seeing who got fat? <laughs> it's like a lot of time. <laughs> it's a big chunk of time, so just don't do that. There, you've got your time to read. <laughs> I carved it out for you. <laughs> but for the rest of you, um, who maybe aren't, aren't so concerned with Facebook, I think that there's some padding in our schedules every day of just like nonsense that we do. We do so much nonsense, you know? And, they, and it becomes part of your routine. That, oh, well, I always watch the show, and it's an hour and a half long, and I, I always watch my show. And on Tuesdays, I always get a manicure. It's like stuff that we don't need. What is all this junk in our lives, this meaningless junk? Um, to me, if we can just take, if for us, it was a commitment of a bare minimum of 15 minutes a day. And typically, it was much longer, but it had to be 15 minutes to count. If you take 15 minutes of your day, people, oh, this is my pet peeve when someone says, I would love to do it, but I'm really busy. Really? You are busy to the extent that there is not a 15 minute period in your day that you can devote to reading and someone you love. If so, you are a brain surgeon, and I welcome you to your time being a brain surgeon. But for the rest of us, we have 15, we have 15 minutes a day. I mean, that's just the reality of it. So I'm gonna call you on that now. If mentally you're saying, oh, I don't have time for this, I'm busy. No, you're not. Sorry. <laughs> because when your top priority only takes 15 minutes a day, you find time for that. And think of the things that you make your priority now. You can just change them. That's, that's my take on it. That's my tough love. <laughs> now, I think it's really important, though, to touch on the fact that, of course, there were nights when this was hard. Because when I first started doing these presentations, I'd, I'd give the tough love and I'd say, oh, you guys have to make time for this. And then I could tell. People thought, well, was it just like, kittens and rainbows for you guys? Was it always easy? So I think it's important that, that I tell you, no, of course it wasn't easy all the time. Because I was a teenager at the end of this, and oh my goodness, when, it, when your dad is reading to you when you're a teenager and you have to be home by midnight, it's a, it's a strange situation. Um, some of my favorite examples, uh, I would go to parties, before I had my license, I would go to parties, and I didn't have a curfew because there was no reason not to trust me. I was the most trustworthy kid in the world. All I wanted to do was read. I didn't even want to go to the party. Um, but I would go to parties, and I would be also close to midnight, and I wouldn't have my license yet, and I would say, hey, hot senior boy who drove me here, would you like to drive me back to my dad's house and wait in the driveway for 15 minutes? And then I can come back out. And I was always like this suspicious thing of like, what's going on in her house? Is it like a religious cult thing? Um, people did not know what this was. And um, then by the end of high school, I was just so, I was so comfortable with it, so over people knowing. We bought a whole bunch of, we had like Scrabble and cards and we would set them up in my living room. And my dad would describe that a whole van full of children would pull up and they would just come in and like, I'd run upstairs and get read to, and oh, they'd say, can we come up? My dad would say, absolutely not. This is private bonding time. Um, but they would just sit downstairs and play Scrabble and just hang out, and then I would come back downstairs and say, oh, okay, let's go back to the party. Um, the, probably the most embarrassing um, time, because again, I think I need to tell you these things so that you see how realistic this is. You can do it. It's just sometimes embarrassing. Um, the most embarrassing time, when I was in middle school, I went to um, recycling camp, which, you know, because obviously I was a nerd. And um, <laughs> for all of us who went to recycling camp in middle school, I went to recycling camp. And this was back before you would give a kid a cell phone because they, we weren't very smart and they were expensive. Um, so I didn't have a cell phone. And the camp had one pay phone, a single pay phone. And there was a half hour period for the whole day when we were allowed to use the pay phone. This one phone. So you can clearly see like the tension building up of every day. And I knew I would be responsible. I was like, I am going to be the one who breaks the street because I couldn't get to the payphone. So I would have to do this elaborate thing of like going to the cafeteria and then saying I had to grab something from my bunk and then running to the phone and being there like right when we were allowed to use it. And there would be this long line 
of, you know, 12, boys don't call home, so it's all girls. Um, 12, 15 girls hoping to use the phone to call their middle school boyfriends who didn't want to hear from them anyway, let's just be honest. Um, hoping to call their middle school boyfriends and I'm sitting there being read to by my father, which they don't know, which makes it possibly even weirder because I'm just <laughs> so the one time before anyone got there, I said, Dad, I, I don't want them to think something weird's going on. So is it OK if I say, yeah, and uh-huh? He said, absolutely not. So then he starts reading to me. And about 10 minutes, and I go, everyone's staring at me, you know, waiting to use the phone. And I went, uh-huh. And he said, I'm going to hang up. <laughs> so, <laughs> so there were times when it was not. And I think it's important to note that. But I think it is one of those things that the more you do it, the better you feel about it. And I would compare it to if you are an exercise person, I love yoga. Um, you know, there's always those days where you're like, ah, it's raining. I could totally not go to, I'm, I'm probably sick. What if I get everybody else sick? I should just not go to yoga. But then you go, or whatever the thing is for you, and you leave and you feel amazing. And you think, I'm really glad I did that. I'm glad I didn't talk myself out of that. That's what it was, except for 3,218 nights. Um, very, very long yoga. Um, but I also think at this point I should pause and say, if, it, you know, if here you're feeling a little overwhelmed and you're saying, 3,218 nights, I don't think I can do that. Well, of course you don't have to. You know, whether it's 50 nights, whether it's 20, whether it's just, I will get together with you every Wednesday and we will read. Whatever the commitment is, I think that there's something very, I think it should be commitment though. I think there's something very special about commitment. It's, it's its own unique animal. And just saying I'm going to read with someone is very different than saying, let's see, let's see how long we can go. Play a little game with yourselves, especially if there's kids involved. Kids, kids are really competitive. Um, or men, men are competitive. <laughs> so um, whatever, whatever number you have in mind, you know, uh, Set some kind of goal, try to do it with some consistency. Um, and I think you will, even through the Im possibly embarrassing moments or the difficult moments, you will get a lot of pride out of it. And for uh, more embarrassing moments, see my whole book. So there's a lot in there. So now um, I think you figured out all of the wonderful reasons for doing a streak, and you're probably wondering how to do it. But before that, that's, that's, that's going to be its own section of the speech. I usually pause here to address something because when we have questions, I've never, ever, ever done a presentation <coughs> where someone didn't ask in some very polite way, you're 25, how did you publish a book? Um, so I'm just going to touch on my publishing story very briefly. It is a total, it's not academic, it's just a weird story. I'm just going to tell you a weird story and we're going to move on so that you can concentrate on the rest of what I'm going to say. Because I know, I know, because even kids will raise their hands. Right when I first started doing this, my very first presentation involving kids, a kid raised her hand immediately, just immediately. She said, are you in high school? <laughs> so I have to address, I have to address this thing. And I will tell it as briefly as I can, but it's a good story. Um, when I was in college, I went to Rome University in South Jersey. You don't have to have heard of it, that's fine, it's tiny. Um, I was applying to the University of Pennsylvania for graduate school and I had to write an essay, an open-ended essay about whatever. It was like 12 essays and the last one was open-ended. If you guys have this on your application, cut it. This is an awful idea. I mean, what am I supposed to say? I didn't know if I'm supposed to say how smart I am or how nice I am or neither of those things. So it was like really, I was in a bind. I was going to write about the time I met an astronaut, which is actually a pretty good story. Um, but I, was, I thought about the reading streak. And I said, oh, I'm going to write about the reading streak. And my whole theory was, I'm going to write about the reading streak because it's really weird. And they're going to think I'm a loser. And then if they interview me, whatever I am is going to be better than what they picture. <laughs> that was my whole I was just teeing myself up to be a loser and then be like a slightly cooler loser. Um, that was my only rationale. So I sent this pack of essays to my, um, my English advisor. And she looks through it and she, she sent me back an email and she said, it's great, you're going to get in. Um, let's talk about this last essay. So I explained to her, oh, well, I want them to think I'm a loser. And she said, no, 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 that's not what I mean. Um, she said, this is a really interesting topic. I never, I never knew this about you. And I said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. My dad reads to me every night. 
for nine years, no big deal. Um, and she said, let's get the Rowan PR office to put this in their newsletter. I was like, I don't know why they would care about it, but okay. So the Rowan PR office um, interviews me and the woman schedules 20 minutes and we end up talking for two hours. At the end she says, I'm sorry, I don't think I can put this in the newsletter. And I thought, oh, she just said it's boring, that's fine. I was like, I told you it was boring, you don't have to put it in the newsletter. And she said, no, I, th I, think, I think it should go in the New York Times. I thought, man, this, this woman's crazy. <laughs> so she said, do you mind if I pitch it? And I was like, you can do whatever you want, crazy lady. Um, and she sends them this email about me. And uh, I didn't think anything else of it. And then I got a call from the New York Times. We would like to interview you. Whoa, that was like really insane. So um, they wanted to interview me during one of my classes and because I was taught the lesson of consistency, I had never skipped class. So I said, I'm sorry, I don't think I'm gonna be able to do this New York Times interview. And then my costuming, that was my costuming class, because obviously that's a class I needed to take. Um, <laughs> my costuming teacher hears about this somehow and she said, did you, did you cancel a New York Times article to be here? And I said, oh yeah, and she said, go go call them back. So I, I said, never mind guys, I'll, I'll skip class for you. Um, they came to my house and they interviewed my father and I and it just went just dreadfully. I mean, as horribly as you, I mean, we didn't curse them out, but it was, it was bad. Um, my dad and I hadn't talked about this at all, the story. So he's older and I was young when it started, so our stories were totally like opposite ends of the spectrum. It, what time of the year did it start? It started in fall. It started in spring. How many books have you read? We've read at least 2,000. We've read, we've read 500. You know, whatever. It was, I mean, it was awful. We couldn't agree on anything. And finally, at some point, he said, well, it's clear you didn't rehearse. You didn't make this up. Because <laughs> you're not very good at it. <laughs> um, so we were bickering back and forth. And I could tell he keeps, he's waiting for that moment. Um, I had done a little bit of journalism. I knew he was like digging for that, that moment of truth and beauty and light. And he wasn't getting it. We were just awful. So um, my dad says, come upstairs. I, I want to take you to my bedroom where I read to her. And I could tell he's, oh, okay, okay. He's, he's ready for this moment. And my dad takes him upstairs. And my dad lays down on, on his bed. Or he says, my friend. He calls everyone my friend. My friend, I want you to lay down on my bed. And the man says, absolutely not. So my dad says, okay, I'll lay down on my bed. And he lays down and he said, I have eight clocks in this room. And wherever I roll over in the middle of the night, I don't have to turn and toss because I can always see a clock. <laughs> and the man is standing there and he said, very nicely says, is this symbolic? <laughs> and my dad said, no, 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 they're clocks. <laughs> and he left, like, no, unceremoniously, just like, I have to go. Um, <laughs> it just went absolutely horribly. Oh, and I forgot to tell you about the sandwich. The sandwich was kind of, this sounds like this would not be an element of my publishing story, but the sandwich is actually an element of my publishing story. My dad doesn't know how to cook anything, 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 barely knows how to operate a toaster. So when he came in, when this, when this interviewer first came in, my dad said, I'm going to make you breakfast. And this man mistakenly assumed that my dad knew how to do that. So he, um, he lets him, and my dad makes only one meal, and it's called Special of the House. And if you're ever at my house, do not accept Special of the House. It is two burnt waffles, and I don't mean he accidentally burns them. I mean he will take them out, and if they're not black, back in they go. Because my dad likes everything charred. Um, and he makes scrambled eggs, but someone along the line told my dad that you put a half cup of water per egg. <laughs> For those of you who cook, you know, the egg cannot cook in this situation. There is no scenario where the egg will not be raw. <laughs> It'll be like slightly yellower, but it will still be raw. So, you know, he makes these rods, and they still smell like rods. They have that raw egg smell. It smells awful. You can smell all through the house. And he, he would um, use the cheese that comes in a jar. I believe it's called whisk pie. <laughs> jar cheese. Um, and then for those of you who aren't uh, native to the Pennsylvania area, we have a product there called Scrapple. And I'm seeing some nods and some frustrating faces. Scrapple, for those of you who don't know, is kind of like sausage, only grosser. It is, it is crushed pig parts. It is just parts of pigs that no one wanted that they flattened into a block. That is Scrapple. And he runs that 
until that's black because he understands the difference between raw Scrapple and raw X. So <laughs> the X are raw, the Scrapple is black. And he puts this all of, all of it together, but before he does that, he butters the waffles, but he uses a half stick of butter. <laughs> and if the butter isn't melting because it's a half stick, he puts it in the microwave <laughs> to melt the butter on it. So it's like raw egg dripping with melted butter and this whisk pie jarred cheese that's just liquid. Um, and when he first came in, my dad said, do you want breakfast? And he has this awful sandwich that the special has made. And he said, yes. And then my dad gives it to him, and you can, like, you can smell the sandwich all over the house. And he tries to, as a question, he says, I'm a vegetarian? <laughs> <laughs> and then proceeded to just take the sandwich apart. And no, nothing touched his mouth. <laughs> so anyway, this interview just went as horribly as it possibly could have gone. And I thought, we will never, ever, ever get a call back from this publication, ever. And then we get a call um, to me. And he says, I want to talk to just you. <laughs> <laughs> no special in the house at all. Um, he says, I want to talk to you and let, let's review the facts. And so I give him the facts as I understand them. And to my surprise, uh, the following Sunday, there is a Sunday New York Times article. Which Sunday? You know, that's a pretty big deal. New York Times. Um, and right before it came out, the night before, I said to, I called my dad and said, wouldn't it be funny if we look back on this night and we say, this is the night before our lives changed? And he said, lovey, you are an idiot. So <laughs> one of us was right. Um, but the article comes out the next morning, and this is how little I knew it was going to change my life. I'd already forgotten that it was coming out that morning. So at, I'm a college student. It's 8 AM, first day of spring break. And um, my phone just starts ringing constantly, constantly. And when you're in college, nobody calls you before 8 a.m. until unless someone is dead. So I'm ringing, like, who could have died? Everyone seemed really healthy, like getting out of bed, putting on my pants, being like, I wonder who's dead. Um, and I get to the phone, and the first call is from like Columbia Pictures or something. It said, We read your article in the New York Times. We were wondering if you'd be interested in a movie. And I was like, What is this? <laughs> And then the next call, the rest, most of the calls were from agents and, and publishers, and they said, would you be interested in publishing a book? And I was an English major, and I wrote a lot. I edited two magazines, and, and I did a ton of writing. Um, but I was also very m focused, and I wanted to be a teacher. And I thought, this sounds like a distraction. <laughs> so I would very, I, here I am, you know, 20, 22 years old, getting these calls, freshly 22 years old. I was like 22 by a week. And getting these calls, um, do you want to publish a book? And I would just very nicely say, no, thank you. <laughs> Which I'm sure was not the reaction they were expecting. You know, everyone who writes dreams of these calls. And I just, no, thank you. Um, so I wasn't, I wasn't interested. And then the calls started getting obnoxious. The calls were coming in constantly. And we were back from spring break, and I was trying to, I was trying to get ready. It was midterms, and I was naturally very geeky. I had gotten a B my freshman year, and it was not going to happen again. It was my senior year. And so um, these calls are coming in, and I start putting my phone on mute. And then finally, I turned it off. And I was getting sick. My phone was ringing so much because of the difference in time zones. It would ring really early from the New York people and at like 10 PM from the California people. So I'm getting these calls constantly, just all hours. And I had to turn my phone off, and I got sick. And I was getting like mad at them. You know, these perfectly nice people calling me. I was like, why are you calling me about writing a book? Clearly, I don't want to write a book. What American would want to write a book? So, um, <laughs> so finally, my phone's been off for about two days, three days, and it's Wednesday, and I get a call. I was a resident assistant, an RA, and I get a call on my RA phone, which nobody had the number for. So I thought, clearly, one of my residents is dead. So <laughs> I had to like, find the phone. It was in my closet. I had to find the phone, and I pick up, and, I'm, and I said, What's wrong? And this woman says, hi, I'm Jennifer Gates from Zachary Schuster Harmsworth Agency. And I was just kind of, how did you get this number? And she said, well, your name was in the New York Times. It said your college. You haven't been picking up your cell phone. I called the university. <laughs> they connected me and found out that you were a resident assistant and that all resident assistants had phones in their room. So I called your room. And boy, did I, I, let, the, I let her have it. I said, this is, <laughs> this is such an invasion of privacy. I'm so upset. This is so rude. And then she did this weird thing, which was she was really nice. And she said, that's absolutely fine. 
I just wanted to see if you were interested. I hadn't gotten a chance to talk to you. If you're not interested, I apologize for bothering you. And then I realized she was nice and she was a human. Um, <laughs> and that sort of changed everything. So then I thought, oh, this is nice human. I should be nice back. And I said, kind of like, well, maybe we can talk. And all these other publishers had said, come to New York, come to New York, we want to talk. And I was in Philly, so it's only like an hour by train, and I was still being stubborn. So she, she calls me, and I said, listen, Jen, because this is the way you talk to a big-time agent. Listen, Jen, if you would like to talk to me about publishing a book, you will have to, I'm in the middle of midterms, and I can't leave. <laughs> she doesn't hate me. Um, I'm in the middle of midterms and I can't leave, so you will have to come to Rowan University in South Jersey tomorrow between 10 and 10.45 because I have midterms and there's only one place I like to eat and it is a cash-only diner, so bring me your cash. <laughs> I mean, this one must have thought I was an actual lunatic because everyone else was like banging down their door. She had, she had done major, major, major authors. Any like huge names, her agency has done all these huge names. She was um, currently like finishing up the movie deal for The Pursuit of Happiness. Like that's her guy. Everybody is her guy. Anybody that you can think of, she's probably their agent. She's a crazy woman. Um, so she says yes, which is crazy. And she didn't even live in New York. She lived. She didn't live in the city. She lived in upstate New York. It took her four and a half hours to get to Rowan, and she gets there, and we've got forty-five minutes to spend. And I've been so sick from all these calls coming in and not sleeping that I took Dayquil, which for me is just like I am out. No, it is Dayquil. I cannot survive, and I was still sick. So she comes to pick me up, and immediately I am feeling like junk, like like sweating profusely, just a disgusting bowl of human. And she takes me to the diner, and we order, and she starts to tell me, she says, she, she, she talks, so, I have a lovely vision for your book, and I can just tell you're a beautiful person. And right in the middle of that, I said, Jen, I am going to puke. I need to leave. <laughs> I was so sick. I was like, I'm going to throw up in this diner. So she, this is not the lecture you guys were expecting. <laughs> the first time puke has been used in a lecture here. Um, and I said, I'm going to throw up. I need to leave. And um, we get in the car. She keeps saying, I want to take you to get like Tylenol or something. You're sick. You need Tylenol. I said, no, no, no. I don't want to. I just want to go back to my dorm. And then I realized that she was a really nice lady. You know, here she is trying to give me Tylenol. It was very nice. I said, give me the contract. And she said, you are about to die. I'm not giving you the contract. I said, give me the contract. She wouldn't give it to me, and I went in her bag, and I took it out, and I signed the contract. Never do this. Um, <laughs> it was an awful idea. And so she was my agent, <laughs> and I said, hey, I guess I'm writing a book now. Um, this was like a new concept to me, because I had invited her so I could tell her I wasn't going to write a book, and here I had just signed a contract. So um, I said, let's call all those publishers back who called me, and let's go tomorrow, because I was crazy. And she said, yes. And so we went and we met with all, we met with like uh, 11 publishers in one day. Never do that, it was awful. And we met with all these publishers and I really liked Grand Central and Grand Central, that's uh, part of Hachette, the, that's one of the big five. And they liked me and they called me on Monday and offered me a book deal and I said yes. So it had been eight days since the New York Times article came out. I had the flu and I had no intention of writing a book. Um, and that is how I came to be an author. So, the reason I tell you that story before I, before I wrap up, because um, it seems very off, off point, I have to say, in this type of environment, 80%, to my understanding, of librarians, of teachers, whatever, they want to write a book. And when they see me up here at 25 years old and know that I wrote a book, um, though you may laugh at my jokes, I know that some small part of you hates me. So, <laughs> I'm just letting you know that I did nothing to deserve this. We can be friends. <laughs> I fought this and said, I, which might make you hate me more. Um, but a lot of times after when we're, you know, we're doing questions and, and people come up and say, if I want to get published, what advice do you have? And honestly, the best advice I can have is just be like a jerk to everyone you interact with, <laughs> get sick, tell them you don't want to write a book, and then you will write a book. Um, so we just, I had to clear the air on me being 25 and writing a book, because I wrote it when I was 22, and people just hate that. That's, you can't write a book when you're 22. People won't like you if you do that. Um, 
So that is how I came to do that. So I'm going to move back to this other section of my speech, which is now that I've got you totally rabid about wanting to write it, to, to not write a book, hmm, yeah. to start a reading streak or reading promise with somebody, you're probably thinking, OK, Alice, I'm, I'm foaming at the mouth like a rabid dog, and I need to know how to do this. And I have a few tips for that. First, you're going to need books. And normally at this point in my speech, I talk a lot about how everybody has a, you know, your li local library has all these resources. This is the best crowd I've ever talked to because all I'm going to say is you guys know where books are. So get started. <laughs> um, and then the second part I always talk about, which is like really exciting to be talking to you guys, I talk about how librarians are your ultimate resource when you want to read with somebody. And I usually talk about how, and now it's going to sound like I'm going to you up. This is, a, this is already my speech. I'm sorry. I usually talk about how librarians are superheroes. Librarians are crazy magicians because if I go up to any, any librarian, even like the library students here, and I say, eight years ago, I read a book. The girl's name was Sandy. She had a cat. They'll say, I narrowed it down to four books. <laughs> They're crazy. You guys are nuts. <laughs> There's never even a pause. It's always like, I know what book that is. Um, and a lot of times my dad and I, there's a list of the books we read, and that, that's another resource. If you're going to read with a kid, in the back of my book, there's a list of books we read. Um, it's just what we happen to read. Jim Trelease's book, The Read Aloud Handbook, I think is better, so don't buy mine. Um, but the, the librarian experience is really um, is key to this, because I think a lot of people approach this situation and say, OK, I want to read with someone that I don't really know what to, I don't know what to pick. You just go to a librarian and say like anything, just just like uh, my, I like. Here's an example. My genre, my guilty pleasure, are like first person books about women of the Old Testament. Librarians can name like eight of those. They don't. They there are eight. They know them. You guys are you guys are rock stars. But when um, when the book was about to come out, my dad and I were trying to think, what were all the books we read? And so I would just I would go to events with librarians and I would begin with. Help us out. We're trying to think of a title. This girl swimming, and there's like an icy lake, and she's with her grandfather, and I think there's a dog. And all these hands go, I know what that is. I know what that is. <laughs> so this is my moment of acknowledging that you are way smarter than I am. You guys should be giving the lecture, but there's only one podium, so I'm just going to represent you up here. Um, I also put a list of some of the books that we read that are some of my favorites on my website, which is makeareadingpromise.com. Um, it's a super boring website, so you don't have to go there. Um, in general, if you're reading with a young person, my, mine is more geared to reading with a young person, but I'm going to touch on that because I don't think that's your only option. If you're reading with a young person, I try to say, find a balance between modern and classic. And usually when there's kids in the room, I say, parents, I don't know what it is with the Bobsy Twins. Oh my goodness, your kids, I'm sorry, I'm sure they're lovely books. Your kids don't want to hear the Bobsy Twins. I'm sorry. I'm just going to be honest. There's like the Bobsy Twins and the Toboggan. And one of the kids, or Toboggan is, is in like one of the first words in one of the books. And this kid came up to me and was like, I don't even know what a Toboggan is. So I usually say, you know, if you're going to read Bobsy Twins and the Toboggan, you also have to read Hunger Games or whatever it is they're into. Spoil them a little bit with, be trendsetters, you know, be cool. Um, my dad and I were reading Harry Potter before it was a thing, because he would, you know, and you guys know how this are, because you're librarians. He was a librarian. He said, this book is kind of getting some buzz. We should try it out. And then it blew up, and all my friends were on book one, and I was on book three. So <laughs> all I'm saying is continue to be the amazing trendsetters that I know in your hearts you are. And whoever you're reading with, choose together as much as possible. Whatever you're going to read, say, do you like this? I like this, you want to read this. My dad played this really hilarious trick on me when we would read because he would say, he, um, he would bring home five titles from Scholastic Book Fairs, not a club, but I do work there now. Um, he would bring home five titles and he would say, pick, pick your top two and we'll read theirs. Well, first of all, this is a trick because he picked the five. I'm picking from his picks, but I didn't pick up that. And then the rule was we always had to read 50 pages and then we could decide if we didn't like it or not. So we would read 50 pages, and sometimes it would say, I don't like this book. And he'd say, well, we're already 50 pages in. <laughs> I never picked up on like this. <laughs> and I brought this up, like, I realized this, honestly, a year ago. And he said, oh, yeah, I tricked you good and proper. <laughs> he takes pride in that. So don't, don't trick your kids, per se. Um, but I do suggest, as much as possible, make 
reading a social experience in your life. Um, involve as many people as you can. And this is the part where I'm saying, uh, people always say, oh, I don't have a kid, or I don't have a kid at home. I'm not sure who I can do this with. My, the point of kind of my, there is a pledge in the back, the reading promise, which again, I'm not gonna read to you because you know how to read. But the point of my book that I try to touch on at the end is this is something you can do with anyone. And I'm such a firm believer in this. Um, my dad's reading streak right now, he has one, which always surprises people. I'm 25, my sister's 32, nobody lives at home. Who is he reading with? He doesn't even have a cat. Um, he made a commitment to a senior setter, three senior setters in my hometown, and he goes every Friday and reads them picture books. And they are obsessed. First of all, my dad is a good looking guy, and they're all ladies, so um, he tried to say they like his reading, but I think they like him. Um, but they are obsessed, they, they, they love when he comes, and he has made a promise with them that he will be there no matter what, whatever it is. I could you know, be having a child and invite my dad, and he'd say, is it Friday between 10 and 12 because I've got somewhere to be? Um, I think that whatever, you know, whether it's a once a week commitment, whether it's a commitment to a home, whether it's a commitment to a school, there's someone in your life, and this is something I feel very passionate about, who needs your love, this is my cheesy moment, who needs your love, who is looking for love, and I think the most beautiful way, in my opinion, to share love with somebody is to share books with somebody. Because it's very hard to get into my mind or to get into your mind. I can't access your mind. No matter what you say, I can't really get in there. But if we can share the mind space of a character, temporarily we are the same person. And I think that's a very uniting experience. Um, I think it's something you can share with absolutely anyone, with any book, with any person. Um, and it's just a matter of finding that person who is, who is looking for you. That's my cheesy moment, but I think there's someone out there for everybody. So um, I would advise you to jump in head first and just do what you can because I know you're going to be even better at it than we were. And I'm looking forward to hearing, I cannot wait for the day when somebody emails me and says, we're at day 3,219. <laughs> that will be the best day of my life. There will be a lot of crying. Um, so you guys have plenty of time. What? Some of you, you don't even have kids yet. Like, hello, you've got to get started. Um, so thank you. I will take questions. Am I taking questions? Okay. Thank you. We can you can clap if you want. <laughs>